in electronics and telecommunication engineering. Uh, so I used to like physics. I wanted to do physics, but I had to go to engineering because, you know, in India, at least when I was growing, growing up, uh, to have a uh, you know, job immediately, engineering and the medicine, these are the two uh, fields. Though you know uh, my passion was physics, but I could not do that. Uh, after I uh, did my uh, undergraduate, I had to take up a job, and luckily I got a job in TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, where they were building the radio a radio telescope called Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. Uh, so I that that opened my eyes actually when I went there. I met people like Professor Giant Nalikar and Professor Gobind Swarup. Uh, because the Swarup actually recently passed away uh, only in the last month. And they are, you know, the, the, in the stalwarts of Indian uh, astronomy and astrophysics. So I had, uh, you know, this great opportunity to meet and interact with them. And then uh, I wanted to start, uh, go for higher studies. I, then I applied. Uh, I got some, uh, you know, admissions in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore and other places to do my master's, but I came to U.S. First, I came to Virginia, University of Virginia. Uh, there I did, and then you know I, I had always a fascination for NASA and Caltech. I don't know why, uh, you know. Uh, so when I was a small kid, I should dream. You know, one thing for people like us who are poor, economically, uh, you know, not uh, don't have much. One thing uh, that doesn't cost anything is to dream and dream big. Uh, so I used to do that when I, uh, you know, as I said, I uh, sometimes we did not have two, uh, you know, full meals a day. So as a kid, if you are hungry, then in the night you cannot fall asleep, then you dream. So I used to dream about Caltech and Richard Feynman uh, that I used to read in newspapers. So um, then I applied for my PhD. After my master's, I applied only to three places. You know, I was either brave or, you know, uh, stupid. I don't know which one. So I uh, told my master's thesis advisor that I'm going to apply to only three places for my PhD. If I get admission, I'll go there or then otherwise I'll stay back at Virginia. So um, they were Caltech, MIT and Berkeley. And luckily I got admission in all three places. And then I went to my advisor and he, uh, he happens to uh, be from Caltech. So he did his PhD from Caltech. So he said, of course, go to Caltech. And uh, if you don't know, you know, Caltech is a very small university. It is, uh, it has only 2000 total students is 2000, uh, 900 is undergraduate students and about 1100 graduate students, but it has, uh, you know, uh, 300 faculties and 600 postdocs. And uh, Caltech has uh, produced 41 Nobel Prizes. So, uh, you know, e even these years, uh, you know, Nobel Prize, two of them, they are Caltech alumni. Uh, so it is, uh, you know, it, it has a big, uh, small school, but big name. And when I used to, you know, walk around on the campus, I used to see someone walking by me, the, uh, you know, Nobel laureate. So it, I, it, it's kind of, I used to pinch myself and think that uh, am I still dreaming those dreams uh, or is, is a reality? So where, uh, you know, even though I was in electronic and electrical engineering department, but my advisor was in physics. So I used to sit in the physics building and, you know, uh, only a couple of doors from my office every winter, uh, Stephen Hawking used to come and sit there. And so I used to interact with, uh, you know, Professor Hawkins and all these big name physics professors to come and to meet him. So I used to interact with them. So it, it was kind of a very, you know, surreal in a way. And in the same uh, floor where I was, used to be, you know, Professor John Schwartz, who is considered the, you know, uh, yeah, you know he started the field of, uh, you know, string theory. And then Gary Nugerbauer, he started the field of uh, you know, infrared astronomy. And then another person was David Politzer in the same floor. He got Nobel Prize in 2004 in physics. So it was very you know, physics oriented. And so that was amazing uh, to interact and learn from them. Even Kip Thorne, who got Nobel Prize in 2017 for discovering uh, you know, gravitational waves is to come uh, there. And then when I was writing up my physics, uh, my thesis and finishing it up, and one day I got a call uh, from NASA. 
uh, saying that they have read my papers and they know about me. So they wanted to uh, me to go and interview them, interview them at JPL. So of course, you know, luckily at that time, we did not have any um, uh, video phones. So otherwise they would have seen me that I'm jumping up and down. So I, uh, I, I went uh, for an interview and they uh, offered me a job. Uh, though the you know because this is a you know research place so my uh, salary was not as much as uh, i actually i had been contacted by uh, many other companies where you know that is they're offering me twice the salary but uh, i uh, went to my dream place and that's how i landed up in nasa and i'm enjoying every moment of it it's so inspiring so are you so dedicated throughout your career? I'm sure a lot of us also dream just the way you want it to be where you are today. We all dream about that. It is so inspiring. It really motivates us. So moving on to the next question. So how was your journey in exploring your interests and career and pursuing it throughout your life and through all the ups and downs? What kept you going and what it is that has motivated you in your journey? Yeah, the motivation part actually came from if someone asked me that, uh, who has been uh, your uh, main motivator? You know, uh, when you are a kid, when and also when like you are all in uh, undergraduate, uh, doing your undergraduate degrees, and sometimes we don't really know what uh, what is our calling, what exactly we want to do. You know, if I go and tell, I knew exactly what I will be when I was doing my under undergraduate days. I will be lying because sometimes you change, you know, something uh, that uh, you become passionate about. Uh, suppose you are going in as electrical engineer or a computer science, but after you go into college, you take a class in physics and you become really passionate about physics and then you start studying physics. So it is, uh, it is a, a, always a possibility. So uh, for me, um, I when I joined TIFR, I was working, I was building radio astronomy instrumentation. Uh, so that actually started, um, you know, I, I had a background, of course, I took microwave classes and electromagnetic classes, uh, but I did not know at that time that that will be my, you know, future. But when I started looking into, uh, started working in TIFR, that gave me a little bit more, uh, you know, clarity in a way that what I want to do. And since then, I have been, you know, when I came to NASA, I have been building instruments and uh, mission concept, new concept to uh, you know, understand the science. You know, what we do in NASA, uh, in a way that we, act, many of you might think that we actually build new cool technologies. That is true. Uh, but prime motivation for our work is to do science, basically answer big science questions. So it is, uh, you know, connecting the science and technology has been a really uh, uh, one of the most uh, amazing aspect of my career. And then that's what inspires me, what uh, really interests me. Uh, so that has been, you know, if you can develop some technology, some cool technology, but if, if it does not have much use, uh, then, uh, then why are you doing it? So in a way, the work that I do has meaning because we are trying to answer some big unknown questions like you know how stars and galaxies are formed you know from where we all came from are we alone in this universe you know uh, from where the water came to earth so th these are big questions is there life on uh, on venus you know recently if you must have seen a newspaper that there has been phosphine has been detected in the atmosphere of venus and uh, we have been thinking about you know uh, sending a probe to venus to answer that question, that will be a huge if we actually prove for sure that there is a uh, kind of uh, you know possibility of life uh, on Venus. So that that opens up a, a very different uh, you know uh, field. So these are the things that that motivates uh, motivates me because once if you are working on something that you are passionate about. Uh, so that is that, you know, and if you, if I may give any advice, that will be my advice that, you know, do not do something that you think that you are going to make a lot of money. And it, it, you know, yes, money is important, but if you do something that really you are passionate about, you will find 
that uh, you will do much better. So you, you can see in, you know, I, I don't know, but you can realize that I really enjoy uh, my job. I uh, never think, uh, you know, that uh, on Monday morning, uh, I do not think I'll have to go back, go to work. I'm pre, -pre COVID dead. Nowadays we are working from home, but at least, uh, you know, I have, I've never had that feeling. I am excited to go to work because I'm, what I'm doing, you know, uh, that's my passion. So, and on top of that, NASA is paying me. So that is the best possible world you can be. So, so I totally agree with you. So, so oh, moving on to the next question. So most of us here are undergraduates in computer science. So a lot of us have this question that since careers in this computer science are gaining momentum nowadays, so what would be the role of machine learning and artificial intelligence? What role would they play in future sciences revolving around aerospace technologies? Yes. So it is uh, very important as you can see that if you write AI and uh, machine learning on your CV, uh, you know, people, are, I'm seeing more and more, a lot of people are, you know, are writing these two uh, keywords in the CV uh, so that they think that they'll get a little bit ahead of others. Uh, it is very important because if you look around that a uh, big data, amount of data, it's, uh, I'll give an example. Think that uh, think about radio field of radio astronomy and in, from space, from the space uh, uh, perspective, when we send a mission, amount of data that we collect, most often we actually do not have the resources uh, to go through all the data. So if you have uh, now someone in expertise in machine learning and artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, then it becomes very different. One example is that you know, we are uh, searching for exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets around other stars. So, so far we have found about 4,000 plus exoplanets. So one of the exoplanets was detected by a Google engineer. So what happened that, you know, NASA had all these big, you know, all these uh, data available. And then uh, he contacted, he works, he was working on machine learning. So he, uh, he contacted NASA and then uh, he got access to all the data and he used his uh, you know, machine learning tools to actually look through all the data and found that, oh, maybe this one is a, an exoplanet. And then, of course, then you then you work with uh, you know other scientists, and then yes, indeed, it was the case uh, that was an exoplanet. So that is this opportunity that got opened up uh, because of all these kind of tools that is available. So if you are interested in machine learning, you should go into that. But again, you know, my suggestion is not to generally to go after uh, this kind of uh, a specific things too early in your career uh, because. Uh, you know, you don't know how, what will happen. I know the machine learning and AI will play a big role in coming year, that's for sure. But sometimes it doesn't pan out. One of the example is like MEMS. Uh, MEMS, uh, you know, if you are in electrical engineering, electronic engineering, then sometimes you'll see that uh, MEMS was a big thing. Everyone says, oh, MEMS will take over in the next 20 years. Even today we say in the next 20 years it will happen. So you don't know how things will pan out instead if you focus on the basics in the sense if you are doing computer engineering computer science so if you really understand the basics well and when you go for an interview and we we can figure it out you know now it, now i'm sit on the other side right i hire people so if i talk to someone uh, then i can figure out that you know uh, how much you know and how you think because Nowadays, the, when you do the hiring process, it is not about you know sending you to the to the blackboard. At least here, it does not happen that when you come for an interview, I'm not going to send you to the blackboard or whiteboard uh, and ask you to solve something, because that is not my aim. I I want to find out how you think because when you go to your know, workforce, you will be uh, facing challenges. You'll have to solve problems. So how you think, how you work in a team. Uh, because it is not a individual work anymore. You, you are all, you'll be all be working in as a team. So how the interaction happens in a team, how you think, 
what is what is your how you the basic knowledge is because if your basics are very good then if ai comes along if um, uh, machine learning comes along you'll be able to pick up so if you know all this ai and machine learning is not going to be very different uh, because you know what the basics are so focus on that but yes to you know uh, i'm really long way to answer your question that they are going to play a very important role in not only in space science in many other areas like you know medical sciences and other places as well thank you for the extremely insightful answer i'm sure it would help a lot of people here so following up on this how does one exactly like how does one explore the various options and decide which field they want to pursue in their life because at times what is relevant today might not be relevant 5 or 6 years down the line so uh, so should a person incline his interest towards something that is a higher scope or to the natural calling like so yeah so you have to uh, this is a very good question because you know there is no silver bullet to be honest that if i cannot say that okay this is the uh, algorithm for uh, for success so it is you have to find out uh, you know what what is your interest like sometimes people go into when you uh, iiit have joined and then you find that he is a amateur radio club let's say and you join there and then you start getting interested in that area you start on your own you start studies and someone will tell you hey don't why are you wasting your time that is not the area you should focus on but uh, you know but if you are passionate about that you are actually going to really learn the basics and you will find that maybe not many but jobs are available in that i don't blame you know a lot of people tell nowadays they blame students they say that you know nowadays everyone is going to it because india has been doing really well in it area it sector and then that's why they're studying and they, why they're not studying basic physics and why they're not studying these why they're not studying that my answer to them has always been that students will go where there is job because at the end of the day of course your career your passion all these things are important but if you do not cannot put food on the table uh then uh, it, it, uh it, that is not the right outcome right so you have to go uh, where a job is available however my point is that do not give up at that stage suppose uh that when you want to do something but you see that job market has changed uh in the four years like like people who were uh, who entered in 2016 and graduating now they would have never imagined that covid would have happened and things would have you know completely upside down now if you look at the job market now because so many uh, people because there is a big economic uh, toll that is going on so things things change right however you know after suppose you get a job in it after uh, finishing or iit from here and then because jobs are available in it you get a job at it my question but your passion is something else my point is that don't give up at that time so if you can still pursue it never too late that i that i said that i actually did i worked before i uh, did my masters and phd explore the possibility of higher studies and because by then by after your undergraduate maybe you did during your undergraduate because there was some peer pressure maybe your parents said oh you should become an engineer you should become this and so you didn't have much option perhaps to go and uh, maybe you want to become a musician right so uh, but after you get a job you can still pursue because then you, you get sense of clarity that okay this is what i really i want because it is very uh, unfair on our part to expect that someone is finishing his 12th grade uh, that i you know isc or you know whatever that they will have complete clear sense what they want to do but we actually force them right in a way that okay no go to medical or go to engineering or go to physics or go uh, commerce so but here at least in the united states things are much flexible because i know i see people who have done undergraduate in history and now they are uh, then they went and did phd in chemistry and became uh, you know big uh, big name professors and doing great so Th that opportunity, that option should be available because uh, if that is available, then you can pursue because your interest might change. 
So I know it is, again, maybe I did not give any crisp answer to because there is no uh, you know, a correct answer for this. But uh, my point is that if you can, you can afford, you know, some, some people cannot afford that they will have to take up a job because of the uh, economic situation. But if you can afford, you know, not everyone is economically that struggling. Suppose your parents uh, are okay, then uh, they will have your bank, right? So you can do experiments. You can actually try out your passion and see how it goes. And if you really put your heart to it, you, you will be a happy person. True, sir. True. Thank you so much for answering our question. So uh, following up on this. So a lot of students here are pursuing in India are pursuing their Bachelor of Technology BTEC. So there was a common question among all of them. So it was like, what is the roadmap for a person who is pursuing his undergraduate? Or how can an Indian computer science student who is interested in the field of aeroscience get into NASA, get into the industry and experience it? So and also is it necessary to pursue higher education or is it just preferable to so get into is, NASA and ISRO? This is a very good question. You know, I, uh, this, this question I uh, am asked a lot of times. So let me answer the second question first about higher studies. I always encourage people to go to higher studies uh, because you know, when you are doing an undergraduate, you get a you know, set of tools, of course. You, what you learn during undergraduate is like a kind of a set of tool in your toolbox so that you are, uh, you can be gainfully employed. That is the term people use uh, quite a lot. So, but what higher studies does? I encourage people to do higher studies to do PhD because PhD is a training ground where you are, you know, kind of put through a grinder and you have to find your way out because the by definition of a PhD that you are trying to do something for the first time that no one has done. Right, you are trying to solve a problem. You are working on a thesis. That's uh, you are working on some research that no one has done before. This new area, and in the process, you actually uh, there is lots of a lot of ups and downs. You can talk to any student who has done their anyone who has done their PhD. So they have always ups and downs because sometimes things work, sometimes things doesn't work. But it gives you this idea of how uh, you know uh, things work. Right, where to find information, how actually things work. So it opens up your uh, you know, horizon. In a way, people say that during PhD, you are going, in, going deep. That is true. But at the same time, it actually opens your, the breadth uh, of knowledge also opens up because you are in a way on your own uh, for the first time. Because when you're doing undergraduate, what you are learning is that, okay, someone has written a book, someone said, this is how things work. You read them, you try to understand that, and that's it. And then they will test on your knowledge that how much you have understood what is already done. But when you are doing your PhD, for the first time in your life, you are trying to find your path, find your way around. And that training, that itself, I'm not talking about the outcome of your PhD, but the, the process itself, is very, very useful for your future life. So it is important. And as well, for higher studies right now, suppose some of you are in your fourth year, you will be graduating uh, you know, next year. We do not know what the economic situation will be, what the job market will be. So if you can afford, it might be a good time to think about higher studies. The reason is that since if the jobs are not that available, a lot of people have been laid off. So companies, they will try to hire back those people uh, because it would be unfair to just you know, not hire some experienced people that were there working well. So, and of course they will be hurting economically so they won't be able to hire new people. So in that said case, if you can afford, go for a higher study and you know, uh, you know, try to explore that, what, uh, get some extra set of skills that so that you can become more marketable in that way. And uh, so in, in answering this, I forgot what the first question was. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you so much for answering it. Uh, so the first question was like a roadmap to people who want to join. Or to go to NASA. NASA. Okay, yes, okay. yes. So, you know, if you are in India, of course, NASA hires everyone. There is a, 
uh, saying there is some misinformation out there that uh, if uh, to work in NASA, you have to be a US citizen or green card holder. That is not true because uh, I am one of the examples because when I joined in, I did not have green card. I did not, I was not a US citizen. I was an Indian citizen, but still they hired me, right? So uh, they, we take people from all over uh, the world. One of the reason I tell uh, that the success of NASA has a lot to do with the diversity of the people, diversity of thoughts that we have. We have people from all over the globe in our lab. They, uh, you know, they come from all name a country and you'll find someone from that country here. Uh, so, yes, so we, we hire people. So how, how can, suppose you are in India, how can you actually join NASA? So it is to join as a staff at NASA directly from India is difficult. It's very difficult because how do I actually find out uh, how you are, you know, how good you are, right? So instead, uh, if you are already here in the US, then we can call you for interview, we can meet you because this personal interaction, as I was saying about the hiring process, the beginning, you know, of course, nowadays we are in Zoom, Zoom and, uh, you know, WebEx, all these stuffs are becoming much more common. Uh, but still, there is a, a need for human to human interaction. So that for hiring process, this is very important, if we, we see. So uh, generally, it is very difficult for us to hire someone directly from India. So if you come to US, if, if, suppose you are already here, then even if you are not doing a higher study, suppose you are having a job here, then we, we, we can actually interview and you, you can be hired. But the best possible way to get into NASA is to do higher studies in the US. Come for your master's or PhD, and then you can apply uh, for any position at NASA. And I tell people the best way to come here is suppose you do PhD in, uh, in India or anywhere else, then you can come as a postdoctor fellow. You won't have to do your PhD from U US or you know, Europe or anywhere else. If, suppose in India, so you do your PhD, then you can apply for a program called NASA postdoctoral program, NPP. If you do a Google search, you will get all the details. So we get, we take people from all over the globe directly as an NPP fellow. So that is a two years, a very highly paid fellowship. Uh, so I think this is one of the more highest paid uh, fellowship uh, available. So you, you come here, it's very competitive, of course. And I like, I take a lot of uh, postdoc right now. I have two and two more are coming in. So I, I cannot take any more, unfortunately, uh, but people do take, and we, we have a lot of NPPs. So this is one of the best possible way because once you come as a postdoc, now we are interacting with you. We know, uh, you know what are your capabilities are. And our experience has been that majority of uh, the postdocs uh, in PPs, uh, they stay back as, as staff. We hire them if they are interested. Uh, so uh, that is one of the uh, easiest, uh, I won't say easiest, maybe the best possible way uh, to come to NASA. Thank you so much. So I'm sure people are finding it really insightful and it will help a lot of students here who are aerospace, aerospace enthusiasts. So uh, next up, we have a question by Archit. So he says, given the nature of the work in NASA, like making equipments and working with high-end machines, how is JPL and NASA adopting to COVID and work from home trans transition? Yes, that is that has been a big challenge uh, for all of us, you know, that uh, so uh, we, I, last time I went to, it was in March, sometime middle of March, since then we mostly, we are working from home uh, and our right now, uh, you know, still we had from the beginning and that time itself, we had some percentage of people who had to go to uh, lab because we have a lot of assets, right, in the space for maintenance and communicating with them. So we'll have to be, some people have to be uh, on lab and also we were at that time preparing for launching of March 2020, the rover, the Perseverance rover mission that launched in July, right? So uh, some percentage of people had to go in a, you know, safe and you know, social distancing, all, all those stuff maintaining. But since then, we have 
opened up our lab in a very small way in the sense right now if you if we see percentage of maybe total 20 percent of the people are going to lab uh, going back to lab so most of us are working from home and that is of course impacting our uh, work in a, in a massive way but what there is a term that we use is called, called touch employee basically you 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 are if you are someone that you have to touch something uh, like to do measurement, hold something in your hand to do measurements. Uh, so like lab assistants, you know, lab work. So we are giving priorities to them uh, so that they can first go and, you know, they do some, suppose I have some design, things have come in and we have to assemble and they will assemble it and keep it ready. Maybe then I can go one day. And of course, I have to sign up. We have to go through a lot of protocols so that we have only 1% in a certain area. Uh, and we change all our filters and everything. So the airflow has changed. So a lot of investment has been done, but still very few people are going to the lab. So then, you know, I, I am doing the designs and doing simulation from home. And then we send it out for fabrication. It's taking much longer for fabrication. And then it comes back, those, you know, touch employee that we call them, they can go and assemble that one of us can go and measure. So then that's how we, we are making progress. But, you know, of course, uh, as I was saying that it has impacted our uh, you know, uh, the efficiency. However, we are utilizing that time to do something else. And that is one of the, our job is also thinking, right? What is the next uh, mission that we can do? What is that next uh, problem that we should be able to solve? So we are doing a lot of brainstorming. Brainstorming works better face to face, absolutely. But uh, but we we'll have to you know do it the uh, OBEX or Zoom right now. So we are doing all those and you know writing all the paper that I wanted to write that I could not write because of lack of time. So we are doing you know all this way. But I am hoping uh, that maybe you know uh, sometime in the near future. But uh, the way things are going, we don't think that maybe middle of next year. Uh, that to maybe 70, 80% people will, will only go. So, yes, so it, it is, it has been challenged, no doubt, but we are finding, you know, we, in a way that you know, human beings are very really resilient. So if we are finding in a way, who knew, uh, just, I, I had used Zoom uh, before COVID uh, once or twice, but now Zoom has become a verb like Google, right? So who knew? So, if, and, and these platforms are improving day by day. So, these things are coming along and we're figuring out how how we can manage in given the situation that we are in. Um, thank you, sir. So following up on a COVID question, so this is something related to that. So uh, am I audible? Uh, sir, am I audible? Yeah, yes, I, I can hear you. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. So do you think careers will gain the same momentum post-COVID as the economy of almost every country has been hit very hard? And to it, and to add to it, will the aerospace sector in India bloom post-COVID? And if yes, then what are going to be the factors that will determine its growth? So I, I don't think that there will be uh, a change in trajectory in terms of aerospace given, because if you think about it, um, if the investments, as, yeah, of course, how, how the investment go, that will be uh, critical. However, if you think about the aerospace industry, it creates a lot of job, right? And on the, the if you keep us at the science aspect of it, uh, but in terms of all these, you know, your facilities, in terms of your satellite communication, uh, in uh, so uh, those will continue. So I don't think there will be much of it, maybe a little bit, little bit of uh, deep, but not a complete downward shift that that's my uh, you know assessment of the future however it is a post covid world i think there will be a lot of opportunity in the health sector if you think about it that we uh, we we realize uh, during the covid that how ill equipped a lot of places have been in terms of the uh, you know uh, instruments and uh, for uh, healthcare so scanning instruments like the ventilators and all kinds of stuff. So this is a huge opportunity to uh, invest in the health uh, sector because you know people's health is one one of the most important thing. But we 
that there has been a lot of growth. If you look at, go to a hospital nowadays, if you see all those, who are building those equipment? Not doctors. Doctors are using, doctor nurses are using those things, are building, those are built by engineers, right? Electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, computer science people, computer engineers. So we need people there. So there will be a lot of new job about telemedicine, if you think about it, because now we have these platforms, uh, online platforms, then telemedicine could be a great thing. So to do telemedicine, then we need to have uh, low cost and high performance, all these equipments which can measure your blood pressure, you know, all, all different things. And then someone, uh, that data is uh, being transferred to a doctor who is sitting somewhere else. And then they are saying, okay, this is the treatment that you need to follow. So this is going to open up some new areas that we have not, we knew about it, but we're not investing. So, uh, so I, I always see in that way that these problems we'll have to look at the brighter side if we can. I know it is tough nowadays, but still that what new opportunities it brings. And then I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of new areas will come up because I, I mean, health sector is one of them that I'm mentioning, maybe the other areas, it will actually open up. Uh, so there'll be new jobs in those areas. I totally agree with that as well. But so there is a popular opinion that with every day, there are new emerging technologies and it is leading to an like exponential increase. Like these technologies will be increasing exponentially in the future. And so will the technologies. And with that, human efforts will decrease. So do you think this will impact jobs and employment opportunities in the future? Uh, you know, that is a false argument that I have. I, we have heard it for a long, long time like that, you know, remember, if, I don't know, maybe all of you are too young to remember, perhaps, uh, before you were born, perhaps, uh, in India, uh, railway reservations were done manually. There was no computerized railway reservation. I remember at that time, when first computerization uh, started coming about, and people were up in arms saying, Oh, there are a lot of job loss will be there because computer is going to take over uh, because railways employ a huge amount of people. Now look at look what happened because what happened as the technology comes in, yes, they replace job at certain sectors, but they, it opens up job in other areas. So if you think about it, you need someone to maintain those, right? New technology that you are uh, developing that is replacing some jobs in some areas but it's creating jobs in other areas. So it is never that it is that, you know, it, uh, net negative. I don't think that way because we'll have to be trained. Yes, people who have been working in certain area where the jobs are going to go away because of the, you know, uh, machines, because of all these, you know, art, you know, uh, you know automation. Uh, automation will happen, automation will keep on happening, but it will create jobs in other areas. Same way, if you, Go to a modern car making uh, you know, plant. You will find that it is so much of it is automated. That was not the case before. You know, when you know uh, ambassador cars, you, you, many of you might not even seen an ambassador car. When they used to be manufactured, it was in India, they were done mostly you know, uh, by manual labor. But with time, now if you go to a Maruti factory, modern Maruti factory, you will see that it's very, very different. But, you know, new jobs have been created. Who is going to operate those machines? Who is going to maintain those machines, right? So you know, if you retraining, you know, from, from the policy point of view, you know, I, I know that you guys are not in the policy yet, policy making uh, yet, but at least from a government or policy making perspective, we have to always think that how we retrain people so that they are productive in the new economy because economy will shift. Uh, automation will you know, uh, create jobs in one area and take jobs away from other areas. So it is, uh, it is not that we should actually not take advantage of the new technology thinking that you are going to uh, lose all these jobs because they will replace human beings. I don't think uh, that, uh, we are going to replace human beings. Okay, so thank you. Uh, uh, next up, we have a question by Khalid. So he says, if we fail at something we're working towards, 
then how do we motivate ourselves so basically how do we handle failures with grace and motivate ourselves yeah failure it will happen you know we fail every single day all of us if you think about it uh, that we were so we trying to do something suppose you are going to cook let's I, i'll give an example i i like cooking if you are going to cook something you think okay i read the recipe i do everything and i cook it and it turns out not that tasty that you want it to be it it happens right cooking is kind of not uh, it doesn't really it's not a linear process unfortunately for some reason so that is a failure right what do you do then how do you handle failure is one of the most important way of your mental makeup you have to actually train yourself if you know that you know you are going to fail yeah i'm trying to do something i'm trying to design something i'm trying to give an exam but maybe i am not going to do well if you a priori if you actually prepare yourself saying that you know failure will come but what can i learn from it i know this is a cliche right that everyone is oh everyone says that but you know how do you really deal with it so everyone you have to figure out in your own way that is i cannot tell that i deal failure in one certain way but that might not work your way but if you are prepared you should think that you know i try to analyze you know it happens as i say that uh, i fail i suppose something doesn't work and then i give myself one day 24 hours to brood over it so you can you can have 24 hours to actually feel bad about yourself cry do whatever you know be grumpy but after 24 hours you have to you know you, you don't you should not think about that what you'll have to do then is actually go back try to go back in your mind and try to think what did i do what i could have done differently uh, that uh, that that outcome would have been different so if you actually analyze that it really helps it's like uh, you know uh, if there is an organization in the us called faa federal um, aviation authority as well as ntsb national transportation safety uh, so why i'm bringing that up you have seen that there when there is a air crash you know there is a air uh, hope that it doesn't happen uh, often but it happens sometimes right what do they do they collect each and every you know fuselage every you know piece of things and try to put everything together and they spend a huge amount of time trying to analyze what went wrong if you if you, you must have seen that right in if you go on you know youtube will find a lot of those videos available and every single even this very smallest of plane if it goes down and crashes they do the same thing why because they are trying to understand what went wrong and how what you can do to prevent that from happening if you take the same approach in your life sometimes it is beyond failure happens it is because it is beyond your control right sometimes it does happen beyond your control then you should not brood over it because if you, you, you think that you have done whatever you could have done after analyzing everything uh, that you then you should not feel bad because that will be a learning experience to do better next time so that's that's how i treat it i i i i do not know whether it will work for you but you'll have to figure out in in your way to think that you know think through this reanalyze that what you have done and what you could have done so that in future you are not going to do this because if we learn from our failure that is a big positive boost for your future but if you're not learning you know everyone says if you're not learning from your failure then uh, what is the point so uh, so that's how i see it yes so i agree with you and i do believe that we can either run from our failures or we can learn from it because in the end failure teaches more than anything else absolutely moving on we have a question by anyansh so he says so i am interested in robotics and i work on small scale projects on my own i'm very curious as to how one goes from working on these small scale college projects to working on something as complex and as elaborate as the mass rover what is this transition uh, transition like you know uh, this is uh, th- that is how all the things work in the sense that you start in a small way 
if you start a you know big suppose uh, you know undergraduate you start building a uh, mars curiosity or mars uh, for perseverance rover what what do you think will be the outcome it might not be that great right so always that what you are doing building uh, a small uh, some robot you are learning what works what doesn't work so you are gaining the skills those are very very valuable when you uh, you want to go to take the next step so it is that you know you keep working keep learning as much as you want to go deep in the sense that you try to understand all this you know as you, i won't have to tell you that when you are working on a robot it is not just one particular area of expertise you really need to have a uh, you know a kind of uh, knowledge uh, you know a lot of different disciplines you have to know about mechanical engineering you have to know about electronic sensors you have to know about some thermal issues right uh, and you know even for some kind of architectural issues that how how can you make it more efficient uh, you know some structural issues so there is a lot of different things and not that you will become expert in all of them but at least you will have to have that overall understanding you know some people uh who the most valuable people in this kind of area is someone who has a better good understanding of the overall structure we call them system engineers uh right so system engineers are other who are looking at the entire system so system engineering job is very important and the training that you are getting now by building a small robot is the one that will actually uh, uh, kind of help you to become a system engineer in future so this is the path forward that if you whatever training that you are getting whatever you are building you write on your resume you write on your cv and when you come and talk to people who are working on this you know mars rover they will see that immediately because the way you speak when you have built something on your own and you have done you have dealt with all these different challenges is very different from someone who has just seen the Uh, overall you know sketch of the drawings and everything it's completely different because your knowledge uh, you know shows up when you start talking about something of, of a given subject you know it doesn't take much for an experienced person to uh, find out whether someone is giving bs or you really know uh, what you are doing so that is the way i th- i'm very glad to know that you are actually working on small robots that uh, you should of course look into isro isro is building if you are in space sector you want to go and many other companies they are investing in robots because of automation right uh, so you have you know bright future ahead for sure thank you for answering so um we are running short on time so i'll just take the next question so this was a common question among the students here so how do we decide the field that we want to pursue and should one uh, should one be very good in just one domain of science or be multi skilled and following it, following on this question so if we ha- if there is a computer science student and who wants to do research so what are the fields that are interrelated to it and what is the scope of a computer science graduate in the aerospace engineering field uh, as i said at the beginning actually that it does not really matter if you look at aerospace and aerospace is a very huge area so it does not really matter whether you are doing computer science or doing electronic engineering or doing mechanical engineering thermal engineering you know aerospace engineering so as long as you are good in this we need people this sector this need good uh, knowledgeable people right and at the same time you know what are the there is a lot of opportunities for, for computer science is uh, you know computer science for computer engineering both are very much needed you know that we still use computer we need the algorithms we need still use uh, you know uh, computer equipments and the computer science uh, aspect of it you know uh, trying to solve how you do all this you know kind of you know old arcane the reason is because in space industry we uh, you know we are always after failure so we use something that is older generation but we are always looking for new people who can come in and actually say we can do this better whatever we are doing uh, we can do this better we can do this better uh, other things better so we need that kind of people and then how you choose 
uh, you know, uh, what area that will be your, your will be passionate about that you'll have to figure it out on your own. Uh, that what interests you. It is it is always you know you'll find that you someone if you go take all the computer science undergraduate that in your class, go and ask them uh, that what is that actually passion. You will find many of them computer science is not their passion. I I'll be very much surprised they try on top is computer science, though even though they're doing computer science, maybe their passion is somewhere else. So you know you, you try to realize what your passion is but again you are we are always in terms of constraints given that you know as i said about job opportunities and future opportunities but still if you can figure that out you know if you on your in your heart that you know uh, what you are want to do uh, maybe you want to uh, run a business maybe you want to you know change your field completely and you know uh, becomes, uh, you know, in some area, you're going to be an economist. So nowadays, at least in India, these opportunities are opening up that, you know, there are many more areas where you can actually do well. And even in the, if you go with your computer science background and go to eat economics, let's say, you'll be very valuable because the field of economics is becoming, you know, is a very highly mathematical. And computer science is a field where there's a lot of, you know, mathematics involved. You know different kinds of mathematics, not uh, that much of applied math, but you know group theories and all. All you know better than what uh, I know. So uh, if you are really want to uh, and economics and other subjects, they're actually using this kind of uh, you know. Uh, so if you are trained in one area, you can be very valuable. So always look out for that because you what skills you are actually uh, having now, you are getting right now can be applied to many other areas that is non-traditional areas uh, that opens up. You can go and tell them, you know, I can solve your problem. You are working in this area, you know, some social science area, but I can use the training that I have, the tools that I have to solve your problem. They will find you really valuable, even if you're not trained in that area. So, you know, think that way. Uh, thank you so much, sir. So uh, this is going to be our last question and it's a question by Krishna and he says, so what is your point of infliction and how did it all started for you? Okay, uh, kind of, it, I, if I think about it, my inflection point may be when I actually uh, joined TIFR uh, because I, I was studying uh, undergraduate and, and you know, uh, thinking about job. And one day in the newspaper, you know, th those are pre-internet uh, days. In a newspaper somewhere, I saw an advertisement, very small, that they are uh, looking for, you know, engineers. I had no idea what that job entails. Uh, nothing, no knowledge of that. And, and sometimes, you know, as I say, sometimes maybe uh, stupidity helps. I just applied because I knew the name of the organization, TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And I had always a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, as I said, kind of fascination for science. So I thought, oh, that could be a good place. And then I applied and I uh, did not know much, uh, like, uh, you know, many of you, uh, you know, that because when you are doing undergraduate, uh, we not ne do not necessarily know a lot of things, at least how, what they want. But in TFR interview was really interesting because they just send you to the board, there was a green board, and then they will keep asking you questions and then you try to you know, answer that, solve that. And I, I struggled, but they must have seen something in me. As, as I said, Professor Govind Soru, he was there. He used to pick uh, good people, at least you know that maybe I can tell that maybe uh, he picked me. So uh, I was selected. So that's when, I really uh, realized, you know, TIFR, at least in India, is, is such an organization, it's very open in the sense that there is no, uh, you know, boss and, uh, you know, an employee. Professor Sorup, his door was here, the director, and I could go and bang on his door. A young engineer, just under, uh, finished my undergraduate, he's a world renowned scientist. I can go and tell him that you are wrong. So, I also encourage, this is one of the most important thing that at 
is needed that you should be brave and you can go and tell anyone that that, that person is wrong and that person should not take it personally. If someone comes, a lot of people who work with me, they come and tell me that I'm wrong. I'm very happy if they come and tell me I'm wrong. I tell them, prove me. Prove it to me that what I'm saying is not wrong. In that process, actually, we I understand much more. Whether at the end of the day we find I'm wrong or right, that is not important. It's more important is that we actually go through this process and figuring it out because it's about you know solving a problem at the end of the day. You should not get your ego in front that you know, someone is coming and telling me I'm wrong. Absolutely, this you know it is not true that you will you will be right hundred percent. If you are right hundred percent, then you are not doing something right. To be honest, uh, so uh, we, we are wrong. So I think that was my in a way inflection point that I it opened my opened my eyes. To this area, you know, to openness, to about because science and technology, we need this openness. Uh, uh, in uh, otherwise, if we don't have this openness, we do not make progress. So, uh, before I end this, I want to actually another thing I want to tell you that, you know, one thing I found that you all should at, at least post COVID you should do that, you know, hang out with your friends and hang out and go and drink coffee with your coffee or whatever you like with your friends who are not necessarily are working in your area. They are not necessarily in computer science. Go and talk to your mechanical uh, you know, uh, people, uh, other areas of people, because if you discuss with them what you are trying to solve, then they bring very new perspective. Uh, and that actually helps. You bring new perspective to their problems and they bring new perspective to your problem, what you are trying to solve. I go, you know, when, pre-COVID days, I used to go for coffee every day at three o'clock, you'd find me outside our lab, you know, there's open space there and I'm sitting there drinking coffee and people are coming of all age groups, uh, you know, mostly young people, young, young, uh, uh, young professionals and postdocs, they will hang out. We talk about everything. We talk about cricket, we talk about soccer and wall politics. And sometimes we talk about technology and what we're trying to solve in the process. Uh, you know, they, are, they have different backgrounds. Someone is mechanical, someone is thermal, someone is this. And then we tell our problem what we're trying to do. And they some, you know, bring some new ideas. And I, I'll tell you that I have quite a few patents. Five or six of those patents actually happened at the coffee table that we are discussing about something to solve. And then we said, okay, why don't we try? We do this, I will do this. And let's see if we can solve this problem. And then at the end, we actually solved it and say, wow, there is something new came out of that and we filed for a patent. So it, it happened. So this is one of the most important thing that you can do. Uh, so with that, I learned. Thank you so much, though. Uh, with this, we come to an end to our session. And on behalf of IEEE IIIT Delhi and everyone who has attended this session, I would like to thank you very much. Also, before we close the session, yeah, it would be great if you could give some closing remarks, something that you would like to share with the students over here. Yes. Uh, again, thank you very much. I know that you are all you know, um, in computer science students. And if you're not an IEEE member, I'll urge you to become an IEEE member. I am IEEE member. I am a, a IEEE fellow. I, I uh, am a member of MTT Society, Micro Theory and Technique Society, and Antennas Propagation Society. Uh, so IEEE is very important. Uh, so you should become uh, an IEEE member. And one of the things that I will end with my closing remark, if you might, uh, if I might say, is that I, you know, all of you are doing something, you know, struggling, and you know, uh, and you will be successful uh, in your future, but you know. Always remember one thing, at the end of the day, all the accolades, awards, whatever you get, those are not as important as to become a good human being. Be, look around you, the people are struggling. And if you can help in some of fellow human beings in certain way, be, you know, show some empathy. And that is what that make, that will make you so uh, happy. You know, happiness is very important in life. If you are not happy, you are not going to be successful in your professional career. So, uh, so that's what that part you should always keep in mind. That you know, at the end of the day, uh, the human interaction and uh, you know this uh, 
if we can do something for fellow human beings, that makes us happy. So that is the ultimate uh, pursuit. And I, that's the thing that I try to, uh, you know, follow. My mother had uh, told me that, uh, you know, I end with her quote when I actually she heard that I'm joining NASA. She had told me in Bengali, I'll say in Bengali and then translate. She said that Akash ke chute chao khub bhalo kintu paajano mati te thake which means that you are trying to touch the sky is great, but keep your feet on the ground. And I am trying that. I don't know how successful I am. I'm trying that way. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was so great to hear from you today. And it, is, it was a very, very insightful session. And we learned a lot from it. And I'm sure everyone here found it just as useful as I did. And we got all our doubts and queries cleared. Thank you once again. And we hope to collaborate and host you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Have a good evening. You too, sir. Take care.